the dog and I here in the ruins of the Beaumaris Sioux. Specifically, we're standing inside what was the polar bear enclosure. Now, it's awkward enough with one small white dog, but they used to keep two large white bears in here. There's walls all around. There's a moat beneath us. Just over that way is the spot where the last known Tasmania tiger died back in 1936. The thylacine, the final thylacine, was left out in the cold one night and died of exposure. Some people working here came to its cage one morning and it was lifeless. And with that death was the extinguishment of an entire species. Since then, people have been looking for the thylacine. They go out into the bush to look for it. They've been doing so for almost a century. No one's been able to find any. They're probably not there. The reality is that the thylacine, the Tassie tiger, is now an object of myth. It's a mythical creature. Going back even further in time, there was a bigger myth, and that was of Australia. The people from Europe that initially came looking for Australia did so because they believed a story that they told themselves based on not a lot that it was here. There was a great southern land and that story was so powerful that they got on boats and sailed south. What was myth became real and what was real is now a myth. The idea of a huge southern landmass was first suggested by the ancient Greeks. Egyptian mathematician Ptolemy, living under Roman rule in the second century, thought that with all the land in the northern hemisphere, there must be an equivalent in the southern hemisphere to act as a counterweight. By 1570, the Abraham or Tilius map emerged with an unknown circle of land at the bottom, and it was separated by the imagined torrid zone. If only the European explorers could sail through it, they would find beaches covered in gold and brimming with spices. An imagined land was, of course, filled with imagined mythical creatures, the skiopod, one-legged beings of incredible speed, Marty Cora, the man-animal, hunted by cruel bow and arrow. Meanwhile, there had already been people actually living in Australia for tens of thousands of years, when Papua New Guinea, mainland Australia and Tasmania formed one landmass, retrospectively called Sahul. Different indigenous societies depicted the thylacine differently, painted on rock walls in Kakadu National Park, Northern Territory, a rock carving from the Burrup Peninsula in Western Australia. The dates of these depictions are unknown, but they are beyond ancient. Eventually the Europeans made it. They didn't find the gold, but they did meet strange new creatures. The first definitive encounter by Europeans came from the French in 1792. They came at a time when the population of the thylacine had been reduced, having died out on New Guinea and mainland Australia three and a half thousand years earlier. There was an estimated 5,000 animals on the island at the time. The name thylacine roughly translates from Greek via Latin as dog-headed pouched one. There has been a variety of names, such as tiger wolf, zebra wolf, Tasmanian dingo, as well as a longer list of non-English Aboriginal names. The colonies set up in Van Diemen's land in the early 1800s established farms. The thylacine became an easy scapegoat for stock losses. In 1888, the Tasmanian government began paying one pound for a full-grown animal and ten shillings for each juvenile destroyed. Hunters were naive to the point that they were proud when they could have otherwise felt shame. The last known shooting of a wild thylacine took place in 1930. By the time that society realised that what they'd done was a mistake, it was all too late. 59 days before the death of the endling at Bo Morris, the species was given protective status. The zoo actually tried to see if they could get a replacement thylacine in. When they couldn't, they were somewhat surprised. It was some time, years after the zoo closed, that the magnitude of what had been done was realised.
between 1967 and 1973, zoologist Jeremy Griffith and dairy farmer James Malley searched hard. Exhaustive surveys along Tasmania's west coast, installation of automatic camera stations, investigation of claimed sightings. This all concluded without finding any evidence. In 1983, the American media tycoon Ted Turner offered $100,000 for proof. In 2005, the Bulletin News magazine offered $1.25 million for a safe capture. Most recently, $1.75 million has been offered by the Tasmanian tour operator, Stuart Malcolm. The monies remain unclaimed. Some academics argue that the animal possibly survived into the 1990s, but others are sceptical. Officially, the thylacine was extinct since 1986. In the last couple of years, people have raised funds to clone the thylacine from remaining museum samples. The de-extinction gang's promises of gene editing are yet to be delivered, a technology so far beyond us it feels like fantasy. The thylacine has been etherized into Tasmanian vernacular mythology. The entrance now is not the site of the original. It was further up the road. The Ghosts of Fur and Feathers Gate stands in memorial now. It depicts the animals as they were, emotionally. There are no audio recordings of thylacines. Accounts say that they had a low growl, a whine, a double yap like a terrier, a succession of short wheezing coughs that sounded like a person, and a cry like a human baby. There's no official marker on this field, but if we're to go by the maps, somewhere around here is where the last Tasmanian tiger spent its final hours. The thylacine died right about where the dog now sits, maybe exactly where the dog sits. As much as we put the thylacine on our coat of arms, on our logos, we can name sports teams after the animal, the reality is that they're gone. We can keep looking for them, but they'll probably remain gone. At the end of most stories, fantasy stories, there's a victory. There's something upbeat to say. But with the extinguishment of the thylacine, there is no victory. Not for the animal, not for the species, and not for the people that are left here now, mourning its parting. Despite the great powers of the human brain and the extent of the human imagination, there are some things that we can't put back and we can never make right again. If something's truly lost, there is meaning within that loss. And it's so painful that you can create entire mess to make that agonizing ache within you dissipate, even if it's only for a few moments. <laughs>